Now let's talk a little bit about the features and core differences to see. So this is a non-exhaustive list, but it's pretty complete, I would say. And what we will do throughout this next five weeks is that we will go over all those features and try to understand the basics of them at least to starting from today. So a key thing that I want to point out, a key distinguished feature is the object oriented support. You already heard already about the input and output streams and the namespaces. So that's not too much. One thing that I want to point out here is that there are new data types that are syntactic sugar and make our life easier, such as real strings now. And then a couple of more stuff, particularly the standard library, which we looked already at the first functions, which includes abstract data types that we may find very useful. So let's get started with some core differences that you will find beyond the list. First of all, the file extension. In C, we had .c and .h for header files. In C++, we, we, there are sometimes a little bit differences. So depending on the people who are using it and projects, typically there is .cpp, C++, right? And there is cxx sometimes. I, I guess it comes from extensions. .c for uppercase and uh, rarely you find that one. And for header files, you typically have .hpp as a standard. Yeah, we, you should use .cpp because that's the most common used extension. So in terms of .hpp versus .h, yes, there is indeed a difference in the way functions are declared. And it's very important to distinguish between C and C++ header files. What is important is that you typically don't need any extension of headers in your include, particularly for the standard library. So I could write here include iostream instead of iostream.hpp. Yeah, this is really, you know, making our life a little bit easier because it's clear that we're using a HPP file, right? You can in, in C++ still include C header files, but then you have to size something like um, standard IO dot C, right? Uh, dot H. Um, yeah, so you really have to use the appropriate header. If you don't give any extension, it's always the C++ version and typically a C++ standard header. Yeah. I'd say a really bad thing about C++ is that when you make errors in your code, the errors that you get printed can be extreme. And I'm talking about many pages for a single syntactical error. Yeah, so you make one typo and you get five pages of output. So my personal advice is if you don't get, don't understand what's going on, first of all, look, have a look at the first error that you encounter, the same as in C, right? Have a fir first error, try to fix this first error that is encountered. Typically, a lot of subsequent errors go away. If this doesn't help you, the second advice, which is now new, is compile it with two different compilers, like use Clang and C++ or the Microsoft compiler and so on, to get different error messages. Maybe you understand one better than the other. And as I said, we will discuss, you know, these differences over the next couple of weeks. So a very useful feature is function overloading. Before, when we had two functions, like a function square, we could not reuse an identifier like a variable or another function with the same name, all by the signature was different. So here you see, it might be useful to write a function square to create something like value times value, right? So to, you know, or the cubic function or something like that for different data types. So you may want to create a square for an integer or you want to square a floating point value. So it's really useful that they have the same name. In C, what we would have done is we would have said square int square float, for example, or square f or something like that. Um, here it's not needed in C++ anymore. You can have two functions that have different arguments here, 
So the signature differs. And particularly the parameters must be different, then it will work. Yeah, this is really useful for functions that have the same purpose but work on different data types. So how does this work? Well, when such an overloaded function is called, the compiler uses the type of the arguments, so our call signature, to determine which function to call. Right? So if I would call square with a value of 5.0, it would know, oh, this means to call square on a floating point value and the return type will be float. If I would have called square on a value like 30, which is an integer value, it would have called this function over here and have returned an integer. Sometimes it can be a bit confusing, a, a bit, I mean, it can be rather confusing because data types can still be implicitly casted and you can have a new t option which is defaults in C++, which we will talk next. What are defaults? Well, you can have default values that are assigned to function arguments in the prototype declaration that are used if such a value is not provided. So if I have, for example, a function like box wall, I can say it has the first argument is len, and then it has a width, but this has a default value of two. And then it has a height, which has a default value of three. Right, so that means this function can be called with either one integer, two integers, or three integers. So, as an example, I can call boxball with 10. Now the compiler knows I have to fill into the variable length 10 and in width and height the default values of 2 and 3. If the second value is given 10 and 5, then it will override here with from the default of 2 with the value 5 and so on. Yeah, you can only r use defaults at the end of the list of the signatures. So I cannot say length has a default of 2 but width has no default. That doesn't make sense, yeah? Because then the compiler wouldn't know from the order of missing arguments which variable should be filled with the actual function call parameters. Yeah, so it's true that only the last ones in the list and as many as you like can be default values.